Hey, it's Vicky, and I am back with another installment of my 100 Epic Reads vlog series that I'm doing. Uh, I have my cup ready. Um, for those of you that don't know or haven't seen these vlogs before, this is a series that I do on my channel that I started in 2021, I want to say. Uh, because I bought myself this 100 Epic Reads poster, and it's this poster that has these little scratch-offs of 100 different books that they say are epic and that everybody should read or something. And so I have read now, I don't have an exact tally, I really should count and see how many I have exactly, but I want to say I've read over half of them, probably about 60 to 70 of them maybe. And so I really want to try to read as many of them as I can. So I've decided to turn it into a vlog series. And this is the, I'm mean, trying to think here. This is the one, two, three, this is like episode five, four. I think it's, I think it's five. Gosh, you think I would know this, but yeah. So this is how it works. I put all the books on little post-its um, and put them in this cup. And I'm going to choose two books. Uh, from the cup and then and then decide between those two books which one I'm going to read for the vlog and then it's really fun because then when I complete the book I scratch it off <laughs> revealing the cute little picture the little cute little book cover and I can say okay that's one more down on my 100 Epic Reads poster and the majority of them are classics uh, so that's always good too because I'm always trying to read more classics and there's a lot of them on there that I don't know anything about them. I've never heard of them or whatever. So it should be interesting. Uh, yeah, so far, I guess I should note for this, <laughs> for to catch everybody up. Uh, so, so far for this series, I have read Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway, Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes, and The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. So yes, this is episode five. Okay, so I'm gonna pick my two books and then decide between, I always try to do two different colors, I don't know why, so I'm gonna do orange this time and let's do green since it's my favorite color. Okay, so I have my phone ready because uh, if I need to look up the synopses of these. Okay, book one, here we go. We got, this is so exciting, but also nerve wracking. Okay, here we go. It is Cutting for Stone by Abraham Verghese, Verghese, I don't know. This is one that I've never heard of in my life. So good thing I got my phone nearby. Let's look it up on Goodreads and see what it's about. Cutting for Stone, okay. Okay, so it has a 4.3 rating, which is good. Has uh, 357,000 ratings, so it seems like a lot of people have read this. And like I said, I feel like a fool because I have never even heard of this book. I don't know the original. Oh, it seems like it's fairly new, unless this was like a reprint. It says that it was published in 2009. So I don't know if that's true. Uh, if not, I will post <laughs> down here the original publication year because I don't know if that's actually factual. Um, and it's 541 pages, so not ridiculously long because sometimes that is scary to me. Um, everybody remembers Don Quixote, which was like a thousand pages. It was a little scary. So I do, always, I do take the length into account, but okay. Uh, let's see what Cutting for Stone is about. I'm going to read the synopsis. Here we go. A sweeping, emotionally riveting first novel, an enthralling family saga, buzzword, of Africa and America, doctors and patients, exile and home. Marion and Shiva Stone are twin brothers born of a secret union between a beautiful Indian nun and a brash British, British surgeon at a mission hospital in... Addis Ababa, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry. Orphaned by their mother's death in childbirth and their father's disappearance, bound together by a preternatural connection and a shared fascination with medicine, the twins come of age, buzzword, <laughs> as Ethiopia hovers on the brink of revolution. Yet it will be love, not politics, their passion for the same woman, uh-oh, that will tear them apart and force Marion, fresh out of medical school, to flee his homeland. 
He makes his way to America, finding refuge in his work as an intern at an underfunded, overcrowded New York City hospital. When the past catches up to him, nearly destroying him, Marion must entrust his life to the two men he thought he trusted least in the world. The surgeon father who abandoned him and the brother who betrayed him. An unforgettable journey into one man's remarkable life and an epic story about the power, intimacy, and curious beauty of the work of healing others. Okay. There were some buzzwords there. It sounds interesting. I, like, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. But we are going to see what the other choice is just so I have my options. So let's see what the green post-it has for me. Okay, let's go. Oh, okay, this one I've heard of. <laughs> this is uh, Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Now this is one that like, I know I've heard of it. I know what it is. I've read John Steinbeck. I've read um, Of Mice and Men. This one, if I remember right, is about, oh gosh, is that the right one? No, East of Eden is the one with the Dust Bowl, right? Oh my God, I don't know. I'm just gonna pull up the synopsis because clearly I don't know my classics. Okay, so let's look it up really quick. Grapes of Wrath. See, I don't know when it was originally published either and the, the this edition they're telling me was 2014. We all know it was not published in 2014. So again, I will put the publication year down here. And it's this particular edition that's showing up on Goodreads is 479 pages. So again, not super long. It's doable. Um, and this one, of course, uh, has a lot of ratings, 835,000 ratings, has a 3.99 overall rating uh, on Goodreads. So Lots of people have also read this one. Um, so yeah, let's see. Okay, this one, okay. Now that I've seen the word, I know what it is now. Okay, but I'm gonna read the synopsis anyway, <laughs> just to refresh my memory. So, the Pulitzer Prize winning epic of the Great Depression, a book that galvanized and sometimes outraged millions of readers. First published in 1939, there you go, 1939. Steinbeck's Pulitzer Prize winning epic of the Great Depression chronicles the Dust Bowl migration of the 1930s. Okay, so what was the other one I was thinking of? Tell us the story of one Oklahoma farm family, the Jodes, driven from their homestead and forced to travel west to the promised land of California. So what is East of Eden about, Ben? Out of their trials and their repeated collisions against the hard realities of an America divided into haves and have-nots evolves a drama that is intensely human, yet majestic in its scale and moral vision, elemental yet plain-spoken, tragic but ultimately stirring in its human dignity, a portrait of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless, of one man's fierce reaction to injustice, and of one woman's stoical strength. The novel captures the horrors of the Great Depression and probes into the very nature of equality and justice in America. Steinbeck's powerful landmark novel is perhaps the most American of American classics. Okay, so, oh, they both sound so good. Oh, and it's hard because like a lot of times, like the last couple times, it was like I picked like a very long book and then a pretty short book. So that kind of helped me decide, but these are both pretty much the same length. Obviously, Grapes of Wrath is one I've heard of and is one that I definitely am interested in. I enjoyed Of Mice and Men when I read it. Uh, I liked the writing and such. Cutting for Stone also sounds really good. It's one I've never heard of. Hmm, I've got to think about this. I don't own either book, so that doesn't help me decide. Because if it was like, if I, oh, I have Grapes of Wrath on my shelves, I would have you know, it'd make the choice easier. But I don't own either one of these, so I would have to get them some way, somehow. I feel like Grapes of Wrath is very accessible. I could get it from the library. I'm sure I could even find, like, the audiobook for it. Cutting for Stone, I'm not entirely sure. So let me do a quick look and see, like, what um, the availability is like on some of my <laughs> platforms uh, that I use for reading. So let's see... Cutting for Stone. Okay, the audiobook is not on Scribd. Um, I don't know if my library has it. Let's have a look. 
All right, we do have the ebook. My library has it, but that's it. They do not have the audio book. So this is one I would definitely have to physically read one way or another. Um, Grapes of Wrath, I'm sure I could listen to, but I feel like that is one that I might want to physically read as well. But they do have the audiobook of the Grapes of Wrath on Scribd. Oh, this is so tough. Um, okay. This is a tough decision, so I'm going to get some help. I'm going to get some reinforcements. Hold on. Hey, kitty. Hey, kitty. Which, which, what, what should I read? Which one? Oh, okay. Grapes of Wrath. Okay. Morgie. Morgie, come here. Morgie, come. Come here. I need help. Can you help me? <laughs> which book should I read? Pick one. Oh. <laughs> you like Grapes of Wrath? That's the one? Is that the winner? Okay. Okay, the pets have spoken and the winner is the Grapes of Wrath. They both chose the Grapes of Wrath. So, thank you guys. Now I have to get my hands on the book. Like I said, Scribd does have it, so that's an option. I also might get a physical copy somehow, either from the library or I don't know. I might purchase it. I don't know. I kind of don't want to purchase any more books, but that is one that I think would be a good one to have. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. When I get my hands on it, and I get started, I'll let you guys know. wasn't easy. It was on the tippy top shelf. I had to get a step stool. It was an adventure, but I found a copy of The Grapes of Wrath and I decided to get this one, this edition, because the other uh, unread John Steinbeck that I have, East of Eden, is uh, the same edition. So the spines will be the same. Not that that matters that much, but also of the two they had, this one was cheaper. So, I mean, I don't love this, <laughs> but it was it was like half the price of the of the Penguin Classic edition that was used. So I went with the cheapest one. So yeah, it still clocks in at like over 600 pages. So <laughs> now that I have the book in my hands, I will hopefully start it very soon. <laughs> the girls have decided to let me sit here and give you guys an update. <laughs> they always sleep like this. It's like, I call it bunk beds. It's like top bunk, bottom bunk. They're so cute. Otherwise, they, they don't like each other very much, but they do like to nap together on this chair. So anyway, let's talk about Grapes of Wrath. I am 83 pages in, and it's it's good. Uh, there's like a, like a formatting thing for, I don't know if it's even format. The, like basically the way that Steinbeck decided to write this is kind of weird for me like uh it's about this you know it takes place during the great depression during the dust bowl and it's a it's focusing on this family the jodes and they are moving to california um because they were uh t they were tenant farmers uh, meaning they lived on this farmland and farmed the land and everything but they didn't own it so they get kicked off the land and decide to like go to California because they hear that there's lots of opportunities there. And uh, so I'm 83 pages in, like I said, so they haven't, they're not even, haven't even started leaving for California yet. But, <laughs> but what Steinbeck does in the, with the chapters is like every other chapter, uh, he is talking about the Jode family. Uh, those chapters are longer um, and yeah, you're getting more into like them as a family, their care, you know, the characters and everything. And then the alternating chapters are these sort of broad descriptions of 
just like things going on at the time. Uh, so like, for example, the first chapter was like describing the Dust Bowl and what that was like. And then in chapter two, it kind of hones in and you start to meet one of the main characters. And so that's kind of like, from what I understand, that's how the entire book is. Like he will do these sort of broad, very poetically written shorter chapters. And then in the next chapter, he kind of switches gears and focuses on the Jodes. And I don't know if I love that right now. Um, and the only reason is it is sort of jarring because I will get sort of settled into what's going on with the characters. And, you know, like the last chapter was pretty long. Um, it was like, it was like a 30 page chapter, which is to me a long chapter. And then, but then the next chapter you kind of so it's like I finally get settled and I'm like okay let's see what's going on and then it switches to that other sort of broad just I don't know it, it feels kind of like filler chapters but it is important because he is giving you some context to um life during that time and everything so I get why he's doing it because he's like showing you the broad scope of things and then kind of honing in on this one family and so I get it and the writing's good but it also is jarring um it kind of takes me out of the story uh for a bit so I don't know but yeah so far it's good his writing is um very approachable uh I like how because the main characters are um from Oklahoma and so they have like an accent you know and they talk you know the the when it's written you know it's 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 in that accent and so I kind of like that uh and you are definitely getting a sense of how horrible um it was during this time to be in this part of the country um and just how hard it was on people and so I get oh Oh. Oh, is someone walking their dog? A dog that's in a banana costume? <laughs> oh my gosh. You don't like that, do you? <laughs> Let's just go get him. <laughs> okay, okay, they've walked by. Come on. So I am enjoying it and I think I could definitely settle, get more settled into the structure of the book uh, and, it, and it could like end up growing on me a bit. The characters are already growing on me. I'm already interested. Um, we've only really met two of the main characters but they're both interesting um, and I like them so so yeah uh, so far initial impressions good but you know I'm on page 83 and there's like 615 pages so we have a lot of story to go so I just got back from chaperoning a field trip for Leia's class and it was really cute we went to um, a theater and saw like this little like it was a very short maybe like one hour long um, Junie B Jones play <laughs> and the kids really seemed to like it uh, but it was funny because I remember um i want to say it was ashley from bookish realm this was a while ago but she did like an unpopular opinions uh video and one of the things that i remember her saying was that she didn't like junie b jones she was like she's annoying she's rude i can't stand her and i haven't read any junie b jones but leah does have a couple of her books and i have to say during the play i was kind of like she is annoying <laughs> And I don't know, she just, she just was, yeah, she was kind of annoying. So I don't know. Leia seems to like the books, uh, but I don't know if Junie B. Jones is for me. I think I share Ashley's opinion in that she's kind of rude and obnoxious and yeah. But anyway, it was just nice to uh, go on a field trip because obviously the last couple of years, like none of that stuff has been going on. So it was nice to just have that like time with Leia and she was really excited that I was a chaperone and it was a good time so and it honestly for like being for like chaperoning a field trip it was probably the easiest field trip 
you could ask to chaperone because you literally are like getting the kids on the bus and then like we had to drive separately because there wasn't enough room on the bus for everyone which was fine by me because I personally don't like driving on the bus. <laughs> I get a little sick. So I was like cool I can drive myself and then it's like you get to the venue we had to get the kids help get the kids off the bus into the theater and they're sitting down the whole time. So it's not like you're trying to keep track of, of your group. They're all just sitting in a seat watching a play. And then at the end, you get them back on the bus and that's it. It was like the easiest field trip to chaperone ever. But anyways, it was a good time. I enjoyed it. <laughs> but let's talk about The Grapes of Wrath because I am now halfway through this and I have a lot of thoughts. I, I know in the last clip I mentioned how I wasn't sure how I was feeling about the, the alternating chapters and how different they were and how jarring they were. And I have kind of settled into that. Uh, so it's not so bad I, because I think at this point now you are way more invested in the characters and everything because at this point in the book they have just arrived in California and the journey from Oklahoma to California was not an easy one um, and they kind of you kind of have this sense as they're getting to California finally that you know, the dream that they sort of had for themselves may not happen. Like, it's maybe not going to be as great as they hoped. And so you have this just foreboding sense um, and this sort of sense of doom. Um, and so it's, it's kind of sad <laughs> because they packed up their entire life um, and went to this place, you know, basically putting all their eggs in one basket, like we're going to go to California and we're going to start a new life because there's nothing in Oklahoma for us anymore. Like there's nothing here. We have to move on. And then they go to this new place and they've never been there. They don't know anything about it. They're basically going off of this flyer that they saw that were like, oh, we need all these workers in California. And that's just really scary that they packed up their entire life and drove all that way without even really having a plan or knowing where they were going or where they were going to be working or anything but they had like no other option and so it's 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 sad and you know with the family you're kind of hopeful for them but now you're kind of you're kind of worried <laughs> and that's kind of where I'm at with the story I'm like worried um and it was just really interesting this whole first half of the book because you see a lot of themes dealing with kind of the plight of these people because you would think on the surface, you're like, well, obviously the Great Depression didn't help. Um, the Dust Bowl, these, this very, um, this thing that they just could, like nobody could control, it just happened. It was just this, this random horrible thing that happened um, that just happened to displace a ton of people. Um, it was like, you would think that that would have been the worst thing that these people were facing. And really, from what I kind of read in the first half of the book, it's actually like other people, like humanity is kind of its own worst enemy kind of thing because there are so many examples um, in the first half of the book where they are making their way to California and they are even like when they're preparing to leave for California and they're trying to buy a truck and they're trying to sell off a lot of their stuff so they have money to get across the country. There are so many people that are taking advantage of those people, like of the situation um, and kind of like scamming people, swindling people, um, just not caring about their fellow man. And you see that quite a few times in this book, in the first part. And even along the way, there's just, just this overall um, suspicion of these migrants that are coming um, and you get the feeling that, you know, <laughs> they're going into California and they're not welcomed there. They have these prejudices against them. Um, and so it's the people. But then you do also see little examples of of people coming together. But I think it's because it's other migrants, like they are kind of banding together because that happened a lot where they would kind of, um, families would kind of go as a group because um, they met along the way and were like, oh, let's go together. And so like, other than that, you see them kind of banding together because they're all in the same boat. But when it comes to like people that were along the way, like 
salesmen, repairmen, um, that kind of stuff. Even like the police officers when they get closer to California, uh, there's a lot of hostility and they're just not very nice to these people. And so it's almost like that is really worse than the depression and the dust bowl um, is that all this bad stuff has happened to them. But then on top of it, the people around them are also not kind and helpful. So yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and I'm kind of enjoying sort of exploring uh, those types of themes. And I have to say like of the, you know, characters we've met in the Jode family, I think right now my favorite character is Ma Jode. Um, she's definitely uh, the glue that is like holding everyone together. She is very tough um, and she's very, very, uh, strong and loves her family so much and that's the most important thing to her is that her entire family gets there and stays together uh because like that's her biggest fear is that her family is going to just be torn apart by this move and um she's just a really interesting character and some of the stuff that she has done so far in the book uh to you know to kind of try to keep everyone together and keep everyone safe um and the sort of like stances that she takes on certain decisions that are trying to be made. Um, it was just really interesting to, to, to read about her. And so I'm, I'm very interested in like what her arc is going to be for the rest of the book. So yeah, I would say that so far overall, this is a pretty good book. <laughs> um, it's, it's long, despite it being 600 pages, I feel like it is it is one that you definitely sink into and start to really get invested in. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 not a happy book. Overall, yeah, I'm enjoying this. I think it's really good. Uh, I'm really nervous, though, for what's going to happen to them once they get to California. Well, they're in California, but like now that they're in California, like, I don't know. I just have a feeling that it's not going to go so well for them. So I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> but I will let you guys know. So I did it. I finished The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. It took me almost a month to read this because I was reading, trying to read two chapters a day, uh, but then like towards the middle, some of the chapters got pretty long and I couldn't do it. <laughs> so it took me a little longer than expected, but this is a 600 page book. So yeah, it was a long one, but I am so happy to say that I'm going to be giving this book five stars. This is one of the best classics I've read in a long time. Uh, and it's my second uh, time reading Steinbeck. The first time I read him, I read Of Mice and Men and also really enjoyed that one. Uh, and yeah, I think for for me, for this, this book for me, <laughs> I should say, it was the characters. I just got so invested in the Jodes and, and their story. Uh, because they, you just, you, you're just right there with them through this journey and much of it is hardship. And so you really just start to feel for them. And I feel like there's somebody in that family group that you can sort of see yourself in or identify with or you find interesting or something. And so as a group, as a whole, um, in terms of a character <laughs> group, they were just really interesting. I think I said in the last clip, Ma Jode was, for me, a great character. She she was just phenomenal. Uh, and being a mother myself, obviously there was a lot of things that I identified with throughout the story with her, some of her kind of motivations and things like that. I just really identified with as a mom. Um, and yeah, this was a tough read in terms of, not in terms of the language, the writing. The writing's actually really easy, um, very straightforward, but it's tough because it's just, it is a sad story. Uh, though I think the ending does leave you with a little bit of hope. I think for the most part, you are feeling sorry for this family for much of the book. And it just had some really interesting themes like, I think the biggest one being the ways in which humans treat each other. Um, I think I talked about this before that uh, you saw so many times in this book that people of a upper, 
upper or like higher class than the Jodes often took advantage of the poorer folk um, and were kind of making their fortunes because of their abuse of these poorer people. And But what you also saw in here was how often the, the poor people helped each other. Even when they had nothing, they still found a way to help somebody else out. To kind of support the theme I was just talking about with, you know, these people when they are like literally down to nothing, still help their fellow man when they can. There's a quote here uh, that Ma Jode herself says. Um, I'm gonna read it to you because I, I think it very much explains a huge part of the book for me. Um, it says, I'm learning one thing good, she said, learning it all the time, every day. If you're in trouble or hurt or need, go to poor people. They're the only ones that'll help, the only ones. And that's kind of what you saw time and time again in this book. The other thing that I wanted to note in here is there is a lot of biblical, I don't wanna say references, cause they're not references. It's like biblical symbols um, <laughs> that I thought were really well done in terms of they're there and you make the connections to some of like the things you see in the Christian Bible, uh, but it's not heavy handed. Like for example, when you read C.S. Lewis, oh, he's like beating you over the head with that stuff. And in here it's there and you make kind of make the connections with certain characters, like who they kind of represent. Like there's a character in here that it seems like he kind of represents Jesus. Um, there's a character who seems like she kind of represents Mother Mary. Um, so things like that and certain events that happen, um, that have happened, that happened in the Bible, you can kind of make those sort of parallels, but it's not, really, really heavy. So I, I liked that too. It made it kind of an interesting read, but it wasn't like off-putting. It was just really good. It was a really <laughs> good story. Uh, and it kind of leaves you, like I said, feeling a little bit hopeful, um, but also a little bit, there's a little bit of a sort of ambiguousness to it also. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say if you've ever considered reading this, uh, read it. <laughs> definitely take the time and read it. Um, it was very, very well done. So yeah, I can definitely see why this book is on the 100 Epic Reads poster and why people say, you know, you should definitely read this one before you die or whatever. Uh, because it is, to me, yeah, everything that a classic should have. I mean, you're talking about people that lived almost 100 years ago. This took place in the 1930s. And, but there's still so much of it that you can pull from and appreciate uh, today. Uh, and I think and for an American classic also, it is also just very strong. Uh, and I can see, like I said, why it's on the poster, why it's considered a classic. And yeah, I'm actually really glad I read this because I don't think without scratching or without picking it out of my little pot that I would have read this on my own. But because of the poster, I did and I'm really glad I did. All right guys, so that's it for this episode of 100 Epic Reads. Uh, I will be back in early 2023, which is really weird to say that we're already almost to 2023. But yeah, the next kind of episode, whatever part in this series will be in early 2023. And I'm excited. I can't wait to see what I'm going to read next. Uh, and yeah, that's it. If you guys have read The Grapes of Wrath, please let me know down below. I would love to hear what your thoughts were on this book. And also, I really want to watch the movie now uh, because I've heard it's good and I enjoy Henry Fonda, so. <laughs> and he stars in the movie. So yeah, let me know that too if you've seen the movie. Is it good? I, I imagine it is. I imagine it is. But yeah, that's it. I hope you guys are having a wonderful week and I will talk with you soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.